So welcome to AWS Reinforce and thank you so much for coming to our session, which is inclusive security and how you can build diverse teams to strengthen your security defenses. So as we know, security is very important. It's top priority at AWS. And by having different perspectives, we're going to be able to take on multiple angles when it comes to security. So we're gonna give you some different tangible ways that you can build, hire, and retain your diverse security teams to strengthen your defenses. So who are we and why should we be talking about this topic? <clears throat> Pass it to Carl. Thanks, Sarah. My name is Carl Bryant. I'm a senior practice leader with AWS Professional Services. I lead our cybersecurity practice for the Americas, mostly focused on the Southeast and Northeast. I've been with AWS for a little over four years and I've been in cybersecurity for about 20 years. Um, Sarah and I have been working together uh, since she was hired about three years ago. Three and a half. And yeah. um, we started, I was the first practice leader hired in 2019, April 1st, 2019. And we had about two consultants at the time and now we've scaled that practice to about 150. So we're gonna get into some of the details about how we developed that team, how we built that team, how we scaled, the mechanisms we have in place for interviewing and building a team. Um, Sarah and I are also Amazon bar raisers. And what that is, is a mechanism we have at Amazon to ensure that we are always raising the bar when we hire and develop our employees. And so we'll also get into that mechanism and how we ensure that we are continuing to elevate the level of our teams and the mechanisms we use around that. Um, Sarah and I have also spent a lot of time developing other bar raisers, helping them become um, interviewers and to, to continue to scale our mechanisms around hire and develop. <clears throat> so I'll go to you. Thank you. you and I'm Sarah Curry. I'm a security practice manager with AWS Professional Services. So like Carl, I also run a team of security builders where we help our customers implement security solutions in the cloud. Um, similar to Carl, I'm also an Amazon bar raiser. So again, raising the bar on different types of candidates that we're hiring and making sure that we have diverse sets of candidates that we're interviewing. Um, I also am starting and founding the AWS Women in Security Affinity Group. Um, I'll touch on Affinity Groups a little bit more and how they can be helpful to building a supportive community. Uh, I also partner with different partners uh, that we have, such as uh, Women in Cybersecurity, the Executive Women's Forum, and Subversity. And essentially with these, we're able to use materials that they have in different studies so that we can identify gaps on our teams and help to strengthen our defenses with our security. So with our story, Carl kind of mentioned, but we met back in 2019 and I was new to the security field and I asked him to mentor me. Carl graciously said yes, so he's been mentoring me for the last three and a half years. And since then, he's helped me through two promotions and a transition into management. So Carl's been a key sponsor and advocate for me in my career. Yeah, and I was also mentored back in the day when I started security or in the early 2000s. And so we all need mentors, we all need sponsors, we all need those who came before us to help us and as we continue to develop um, employees and, and, and new people coming into the field, which we're gonna spend some time talking about, but that's our relationship and how Sarah and I have gotten to know each other. Yeah, and based on what Carl and I have learned from our lived experiences as cybersecurity people managers, we're gonna talk about some tangible ways that you can actually build a roadmap for building and retaining your inclusive, diverse security teams. So what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna to go over the current state of the cybersecurity workforce. We're gonna talk about why is it important to have inclusion and diversity, and we're actually going to make sure that we dive deeply into some security aspects and how it can strengthen your defenses. Again, building these teams, how are you investing in your hiring? But then once you go to the hiring initiatives, how do you go beyond that and make sure that you're actually retaining and building an inclusive environment? And then recommended next steps. So when it comes to the current state of the cybersecurity workforce, we currently have an estimated 4.7 million people in cybersecurity, which is great. We know that we need even more. Um, it's no secret that there is definitely a talent gap with security, so we still have 3.4 million open roles. And according to this study, there's also a 26% year-over-year increase in needing for more talent in the security field. So how does this relate to diversity? So these are some really interesting key statistics when it comes to diversity in the cybersecurity field. Um, we see that we're doing a lot of work, but how are we coming up with different diversity statistics? So when we're looking at these different breakdowns, we have about 24% of women that are in the cybersecurity workforce, but that becomes a smaller number when we look at people of color. So for blacks in cybersecurity, it's 9%, for Hispanics, it's 4%. 
And as we're looking at even age diversity and when that comes to different perspectives on different generations, we're not doing a great job at pulling younger people into cybersecurity. We only have about 30% of our workforce from 19 to 34. Additionally, when we're looking at people with disabilities, how are we building solutions that are going to be accessible to all people? Only 14% of our cybersecurity workforce identifies as having a disability, and only 10% identifies as LBG+. Uh, and then where we actually are doing a pretty great job in the cybersecurity field is with our military. So with our veterans and military, we do see about 51% have military experience, which is great. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but when we work with our military folks, a lot of them are really great under pressure, which we know in security is key. Um, so it's great that we're doing that. And when it comes to this lack of diversity as a whole in the cybersecurity world, it's really important because we might be missing out on key gaps in our security and how we're looking at different angles and we'll get into that a little bit more with social engineering and different types of phishing attempts. So why is it important? I know there's lots of talks about inclusion and diversity and how it's a social responsibility to make sure that we're including everyone, but something that Carl and I want to take a different take at is looking at the security aspects and how it can strengthen your defenses. So what are we seeing? Gardner released a report in 2023 that predicts with the human element of security that looking into 2027, a lot of CISOs are going to have to shift their security perspective to be more human centric. Right now, a lot of different programs are focusing solely on technology and how they can use their technology based defenses. But by 2027, there's going to be more of a human element that's needed. We're also seeing that by 2025, 50% 50 of cybersecurity leaders are going to be leaving their role due to work-related stressors. So think about burnout, um, non-equitable on-call schedules, and how can you be more inclusive when it comes to this in, by 2025? And lastly, but very importantly, by 2025, they're also going to see a lack of talent or human failure that will result in over half of significant cyber incidents. So as we're looking at what are we going to see in the future? Um, and how can we make sure that we're building these teams so that we're strengthening our defenses? So as we know, technology-based defenses have gotten increasingly more complex. So adversaries um, are trying to shift their focus to humans. So instead of spending months and months researching effective strategies to get around those technology-based defenses, they're turning their eyes towards humans. So this is something that cybersecurity leaders should shift and look at not only should we have technology-based defenses, but we need to strengthen our human layer of defense and understanding different perspectives. So in 2022, the Verizon breach uh, incident data investigation said that 82% of breaches involved the human element. So when we think about different aspects such as stolen credentials, misuse, phishing, social engineering, as we know that's all increasing. And so it's not the machine, but it's actually human vulnerabilities that are causing the most cyber events. So this is a telling statistic that essentially is signaling to our different cybersecurity leaders that we need to have a better focus on human behavior and user experience and take that into greater consideration. Uh, it also looking at too how we're shifting our technology centric investments so not only investing in technology but also investing in our people we know security awareness is very important and how are we taking on those different perspectives to build security awareness for our full organization so really when we're looking at that 82 percent which is a lot we need to think about how are we building our security teams so that they actually reflect our diverse customers so internal stakeholders and external stakeholders and security, we talk a lot about people, process, and technology. Um, and how do we shift that focus to look at really the human aspect and making sure that we're not using just a silo of only technology-based defenses. And by having more diverse teams, we're gonna have more creative solutions so that we can be more innovative for the customers that we protect. So CJ Moses, the uh, CISO of AWS, said in his AWS security predictions for 2023 and beyond, that diverse security professionals mean diverse perspectives on security, which means stronger defenses. And for us, security is more about equality. It's also imperative to our security operations and making sure that we can be more inclusive and optimizing our defense capabilities so that we have the widest ranges of problem solving that we possibly can have. So when it comes to diversity, you know, we said diverse security professionals, what does that mean? 
Let's take a look behind the curtain. So when we think about diverse security professionals, we might tend to think about what we see on the outside. So maybe gender diversity, racial diversity, but really what we're looking for on our security teams is diversity of perspective. Mm -hmm. How can we have different folks that <coughs> are thinking in different ways, looking around corners about different types of scenarios that we might have in our security? So I put down um, some different types of perspectives. There's obviously a lot more than this, but these are some things to think about when you're looking at building your team. So do you have folks on your team that are neurodivergent and they're thinking outside the box? People with disabilities that are going to have different types of use cases when they're implementing different security solutions so you can think about being more accessible. People with military experience that can stay calm under high pressure uh, different incidents that you're dealing with. Gender diversity and cultural diversity. These are very interesting too, especially if you have a global team. Something that people might not think about is the different cultural aspects of low conflict type of cultures where you're might not going to be escalating as much as you would in another culture. Also looking at age diversity, as we know with the different generations, we're all using different types of platforms. And how are we looking at how we're securing data and privacy for younger generations that might be more open to sharing their data? And then also something that I think is really important as well that sometimes gets forgotten about is socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, people coming from different types of backgrounds, maybe under the poverty line, cybersecurity is a great profession to help get people out of poverty mm -hmm. and to lift people up into generational wealth. So that's another thing to think about when you're thinking about your responsibilities of building a team. So when it comes to the importance of ID and security, Really what it's going to be is you're breaking away from your embedded biases. I'm sure we've all been on teams before where maybe you've been around for five or six years and you're like, well, we've done it this way and that's always the best way that it works. And then you have a new person on your team that joins and says, wait a second, Carl, maybe, maybe we should do things a little bit differently. And you're like, wait, we never thought about it that way. So it's gonna help you to question your assumptions. So it's making you e easier to build and maintain a good security culture. Um, it's also been seen that by including people, it's going to increase your employee engagement rates and that's going to decrease your insider threats. Mm -hmm. So this is a really interesting one that doesn't get talked about a lot. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, again, being able to create more innovative solutions. So looking around corners for people that have had different life experiences. And like we talked about before, there's still 3.4 million open cybersecurity roles. So how do we fill that talent pipeline with diverse individuals? And Carl, who's actually done over 1,400 interviews at AWS and was the AWS Bar Razor Mentor of the Year. So he has great experience with this and he's gonna talk about how you can build your team to be more diverse on security. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so as we talk about building in diverse and inclusive teams, I wanna take you back a little bit um, to the good old days of security. I'd say late 90s, early 2000s when I first started. So I was working for a pretty large uh, insurance company uh, supporting we, migrating from Lotus Notes to uh, Microsoft Exchange and, and Outlook. And for those of you who've been around security as long as I have, you'll remember the days when you can actually send an executable, which sounds crazy now, over an email, someone can click on it and it will just uh, spiral out of control and shut down your system. So this particular company I was working with had the largest private network outside of the military. So it was, a, um, if you remember back in 2001, it was called the goner.av worm. I don't know, if, uh, I won't have anyone um, raise your hands and show that you're as old as I am. But <laughs> if you remember that, essentially what would happen was the worm would propagate when someone would click on it and it would go through everyone's email system and, and basically shut down the network. And it was a pretty significant event. I think at the time, you know, my wife and I had been married maybe six months and I got a, a page at like one o'clock in the morning, for those of you who remember what pages pagers are, okay? <laughs> and I remember my uh, boss called me and she said, you know, Carl, we've got uh, an issue with our email servers, they're down, we need you to come in and help. And I'm like, sure. So I remember going into work at about six o'clock and back then, cybersecurity, which it wasn't called in, it was called like IS security or IT security. It consisted mostly of firewall administrators and ant people who did antivirus. And it was my first war room experience where you're in like a, a room and everyone's trying to figure out um, who's gonna click on this executable next and what's the, what's the next server to go down. And I remember that day I worked like 17 to 18 hours straight. 
And I knew at that moment that that is, this is what I wanted to do with my life. I like, this has got it. This is the coolest thing ever, this security thing. So I remember um, I found two individuals who were, who were hiring to build out their vulnerability management team, which didn't even exist at the time. So it was very innovative. And um, there were, uh, it's, I think it's important that I mention this. There were two white males, okay? And I didn't have the experience necessary for the job as it was listed in the job description. But they said to me, Carl, you've got a passion for this. You've demonstrated uh, learn to be curious, which is something we say at Amazon quite a bit. It's one of our key leadership principles. They said, here are the skills you're going to have to develop and how you're going to have to scale. If you do this, you can be successful. 20 years later, I'm here and I've done a bunch of interviews here with AWS. I've hired people. Um, I've led teams. I continue to lead teams now. But the point is, is at that time, I didn't have all of the experience required for the role. And so that's what Sarah and I kind of want to talk about in terms of closing this gap. We're going to have to expand our pool to help people understand, okay, here are the skills you're going to need. You may not have this right now, but you've got to learn it if you're going to be successful. And that was the opportunity given to me back in 2000, 2001. And here we are in uh, 2023, and I'm still here doing great, and I love it. So... The reason that's important is when you think about this quote here, there's been a lot of research on this. Um, I didn't have any fear going up to the two individuals that were hiring for the role because I wanted to do it. And I said, look, I don't have all the skills, but I can learn. Um, it's, for those of you who know Sarah Curry, it's kind of crazy to think that she um, didn't want to apply to AWS when she was given the opportunity. But um, Sarah, I know you have a story around this statistic and how, <laughs> how much it does apply to um, women like yourself and some other women who may be afraid to apply for a job because they don't check every single box. I don't know if I'm going off script a little bit here, but I can just assure <laughs> you that, that every job description that's written, it is unlikely a candidate that you're going to meet is going to check every box. So, so I've done a lot of hiring. I've done a lot of screening of candidates. Um, there's no unicorn out there, even for people who believe they're unicorns, they're probably not. Okay, but I would like to hear, Sarah, <laughs> if you could share with the group your yeah. experience with that. Yeah, happy to. So I actually come from a non-traditional background. So I actually used to do healthcare legislation in DC. I got put on a project that was gonna last 25 years and I was like, wait a second, I would like to work for something that moves a lot faster, let's get into tech. So I actually did a software engineering boot camp, and one of my final projects was rebuilding Amazon.com. And I didn't even think to apply to Amazon because I was like, there's no way they'll hire someone that came from a non-traditional background that then only had a couple of months experience in software engineering. Um, I flipped a year later, I was a software engineer working at a company and an AWS LinkedIn recruiter reached out to me and said, hey, we think you would be perfect for one of our early in career programs where industry professionals that have switched into security. And so that was that. Was that. And I probably never would have applied otherwise. So um, yeah, so it's cool to see this too, that um, you really do need to look at your different basic or preferred qualifications because I probably wouldn't have applied if a LinkedIn recruiter hadn't reached out. So. Right. Thanks, Sarah. And the reason that's important for those of you who are hiring managers or going to interface with hiring managers as you're developing job descriptions, you really want to think about the wording that you're using in the job description. What is required and what is preferred? So if you look at my LinkedIn now, you're going to see I didn't go to college to study cybersecurity, but I did go to graduate school twice to do it. And I have this maybe what you would consider to be um, everything required to be a cybersecurity professional, but that was over many years of school, which my wife will tell you she's really glad I'm done with. <laughs> but you don't need to have an MBA to start this career or a master of data science to start this career. You can start with Sarah's background, with my background. I was not, I did get a Bachelor of Arts, but I didn't, I wasn't trained in IT. I was given an opportunity. And as you get opportunities, you can scale and continue to develop your skills. So going back to not meeting 100% of the requirements, Think about the, the candidates like Sarah that you may be excluding if, in fact, you have so many requirements that um, are going to prevent, some, from, prevent someone from applying. And you may not, it may not be intentional. You want to say, okay, look, hey, we, these are the skills we need. But I did recently, interestingly enough, one of our partners, Wiz, they had some job descriptions that said, please apply even if you don't have all of these skills because they're like, we need talent, right? And it was the first company I've ever seen actually put that disclaimer. There may, be, they may, there may in fact be others that do that, but please keep that in mind as you're developing your job descriptions. So as we look at um, our hiring standards and our practices, out of the 48 people that I have on my team, 
I have 10 that are veterans, former military, okay? Um, Air Force, Navy, Army, I have a former Green Beret. Um, AWS, we're a big place, so we have um, a public sector business. But a lot of times people think, well, if you're a former military, you probably need to go to the public sector, not the commercial. I can assure you, um, don't bring that bias to the table to the extent um, you're looking to hire veterans and foreign military because I can tell you, and anyone with significant experience in cyber will tell you, you're going to have incidents, you're going to have breaches. That's how I got into security because it was exhilarating. But many times you're going to be dealing, when you're handling a breach or an incident, you're going to be working with non-security people, okay, as a security professional. You're going to be working with business line folks, finance, marketing, human resources. And you need to be able to be calm, under pressure, and I can tell you the military, former military veterans uh, display this in spades. I've seen it over and over and over, particularly when you, it, it seems in my 20 plus years now, an incident is always going to happen on Friday at about 4 o'clock. Okay, <laughs> so you're, you're not going to be in a good mood anyway, but with a, with a former military background, when you have a bad day, unfortunately, someone's dying. Okay, that doesn't happen in our profession. But the experience that they bring to the table by, vir by virtue of their um, military work is, is tailor-made for um, cybersecurity. So um, don't think that someone needs specifically a commercial background like myself. You can hire folks with all different types of backgrounds. In the military that I have a lot of experience with and we do on my team and uh, across our, our company, it's, uh, it's fantastic. So. Um, starting in 2020, I was a single-threaded leader for uh, security hiring uh, across professional services. And what we do at AWS is we have a system called Loops, and that's five individuals that are going to interview a candidate. So you have four interviewers and one bar raiser. Uh, both uh, Sarah and I, as we mentioned, are, are, are bar raisers. But um, in my capacity as a single-threaded leader, I was the hiring manager for a, a number of jobs. We hired over 100 people. And so... One thing that I learned um, and that I ensured we had in place is I always wanted to make sure we had a female representation on our loops. So like this picture kind of illustrates a, what, what a, a diverse panel or loop would look like. And what you learn from that is you, you will get insights into the candidate to the extent what we do is we, we interview candidates, um, they meet with five different people, and then we come into a room, the, the interview is from Amazon, and then we have what's called a debrief. And I have, um, unfortunately, on more than one occasion, seen uh, we come into a debrief and maybe the uh, four guys are inclined and the, the female who is on the panel, if it's one in, in particular case, is not inclined. And what we'll find is that she was treated completely different than the men. Specific objective data points, it's not subjective, things that we can, we can look at and say, wow, well, they didn't treat me this way, but they did treat you that way. I've seen that, unfortunately, on many occasions. And the reason that's important is you would not uncover that risk if you didn't have a woman on the loop. So that's one thing. Additionally, if um, someone is going to be disrespectful and, and, and treat a woman a particular way in interviewing for a job at Amazon, imagine what they might do at a customer site. So it will uncover risks um, that you wouldn't have otherwise. Additionally, you're just going to have uh, other perspectives. We have gotten, we always send our candidates feedback requests after the interview, and we often get comments about this is the most diverse panel I've ever uh, interviewed with. It was, it was great to be able to ask the woman on the loop questions that I wasn't comfortable asking one of the male interviewers just by virtue of work-life balance questions and having a family, what's it like for you, et cetera. So those things are important to keep in mind. Also, um, yeah, so it, it's really good just to have those types of perspectives. Additionally, um, whenever I'm interviewing a, a candidate from the military with a former military background, I almost always have um, someone from the military on the interview panel as well because there are certain uh, aspects to working in a commercial environment that are very different in the military. As an example, um, if, if you don't follow orders in the military, things can go uh, very badly. And I was, just so I'm clear, I wasn't in the military, but these are things that my, my directs have told me. Where, so we have a leadership principle called have backbone, disagree, and commit at Amazon. So like um, a question may be, tell me about a time you, um, you did something um, that uh, without your boss's permission, you know, you just went ahead with it because you saw it was going to have an impact. Well, in the military, you don't do those types of things. So you need someone on the military, uh, former military who's interviewing folks to give the perspective, say, look, 
typically this is something we value at AWS to actually commit to things or be very uh, aggressive and have bias for action. But in the military, there's a chain of command. So having different perspectives on an interview loop will help ensure that when you go into that debrief, you've got all the perspectives necessary to um, at, uh, adequately evaluate a candidate. Okay, uh, another uh, strategy that we've implemented and something we'd encourage you to do is uh, implement as well as um, unconscious bias training. So what types of language you're using, what type of wor uh, words, um, are you, do you think someone may not be able to do a job because they didn't go to Ivy League or they didn't go to a school like mine or maybe they went to um, HBCU, a historically black college or a university? Did they go somewhere that I'm not familiar with people that went to those types of schools or I'm not familiar with someone with a military background or all of the people that are on my team are males and we don't have any women. Can she really do this? I've not seen a woman do this type of job. So you need to have training to uncover those and get rid of those so you can objectively, as best you can, evaluate candidates as opposed to having biases that we all bring to the table, but you work to um, get rid of those. And that's something that we work hard at here and we want you to as well. So here is um, some low hanging fruit. And I will be honest, I think some people think this is a little over the top, but you know, sometimes in, with these ID need types of conversations, you're like, is this really serious? And that, that's fine, you may think it's, uh, not a big deal, but when we talk about inclusive language, you know, it's very common, you know, I was, when I was coming up, I used to build computers, we'd have a hard drive with an image, and then you'd have another a hard drive where you're, you're building a computer, and this is the master, and this is the slave, or you were talking, you know, hard drives, people who used to do that know that, or firewalls, blacklists, whitelists, these are just, I don't think anyone has any uh, ill intent with the wording, but some people find it offensive, so a little, we have uh, Python scripts that can be run, and you can ensure that, you know, we look for these di different types of words to, you know, maybe lead instead of scrum master, you know, scrum lead, things like that. Um, you know, just low hanging fruit with respect to inclusive language. Um, in terms of what we've done to continue to increase the pipeline in Amazon is we have uh, aspiring engineer programs. So we launched this back in 2020. Uh, the goal is to increase the pipeline. They may have, individuals may have non-traditional backgrounds but we want to create an opportunity for them to get into the workforce to close that gap. And those are some of the things that we're doing. And hopefully you can implement those training programs as well. Becoming a mentor is huge. As Sarah and I mentioned the, the impetus for our relationship, she reached out to me. Um, I would not be where I, was, where I am now had I not been given an opportunity when, and was mentored by individuals who said, you have a passion for this, you want to do it, we're gonna help you and that's why I'm standing here today because of the opportunity they gave me. So I would encourage you to give someone else that opportunity as well. And it goes both ways. If you have been in this industry for a while or not very long, most of the individuals, uh, executives that are on boards of directors, they don't know a lot about cybersecurity and they need that knowledge. So that reverse mentoring, you may say, they may think you, you want a job or they may think that, okay, I'm on the board if, to the extent you get an opportunity to meet someone like that. That you, but you can, if you have cyber experience, you can really help someone understand these are the challenges with TikTok. This is what it means. Likely someone who's on the board of directors is using TikTok. But we know as security professionals the risk of that. And so mentoring is huge. It goes both ways as well. So a roadmap to think about as you build your diverse teams, you know, discover and train, you know, gather your, your data from HR, who's interested, the individuals in the program, what can you put together over design and build perspective where you establish a non-traditional strategy for building a security talent pipeline, who are the people that are working in, on applications or infrastructure or in, uh, people who are working in IT but not a specific security role but they have the aptitude, as you build those training programs, you can develop that pipeline so hopefully you won't lose those people that are currently at your company uh, because they're not giving an getting an opportunity. There are tons of opportunities it's in cyber, as Sarah mentioned with the statistics, but to the extent you put programs in place to retain and develop the employees you currently have, this is a roadmap where you can actually build those teams. And then with that, I'm gonna give it back to Sarah and we're gonna talk about retaining those, those folks. Yes, thanks Carl. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as Carl just went over, we talked about how you can hire people. So thinking about your diverse panels, rethinking your different job descriptions to make sure you have basic first preferred, and the language aspect. Thinking about how language can be historically rooted in systematic racism or other types of discrimination and how that may not bother you to say a certain type of word. Why not just change the language to be more inclusive? 
So what we're going to talk about is how do we retain people once we've actually hired them? So something that I see a lot with different companies and different teams is that they've said, all right, we've hired those four underrepresented people. We did it. Check the box. Go team. And while that's great, just because you have diversity on your team does not mean that you have inclusion. And something that's really important that I think is really interesting is the Women in Cybersecurity did a state of inclusion report in 2023. And these were actually the top factors leading to exclusion. So it was a lack of respect, lack of career growth, not enough access and participation, and then little to no recognition or appreciation. And some very interesting quotes that came out of this, and this is specifically from women in security, but I think um, most people have maybe related to this at some point in their career. Um, but this one woman specifically said that after introducing herself as a security professional, the person asked, well, actually, can I speak to a guy that works in IT instead? I see some heads nodding. So yeah, some people might have experienced that at some point. And then again, another factor leading to exclusion, uh, lack of recognition and appreciation. So this one particular woman noted that when she came up with an idea, uh, it was met with silence. And then someone else said, hey, I have an idea. And it was the same one. And everyone said, oh, great idea. And they got credit for her idea. I see some more nodding. So I think people have experienced this, whether you're underrepresented or not. I think it's part of something that we experience in our careers. And it's not a good feeling. You don't feel excluded or you don't feel included. And with this, something to think about when it comes to your security is if you're feeling excluded and disgruntled, are you more likely to escalate an issue? Um, are you more likely to raise a potential new security solution that you think would be a really good idea for the organization and protecting its data and assets? Probably not. Um, and there's actually a really interesting story I wanted to share with you all. So there was this company where a new CEO was coming in and he had a metric that he wanted to have the most diverse employees uh, workforce that the company had ever had. He's also a self-proclaimed feminist and wanted to make sure that there was uh, plenty of women in the employee um, network. And so when he came into his leadership role, he was making sure that they hired a bunch of diverse people and that was great, but then they started to see, well, actually I'm noticing that there's only men in the room where we're making decisions. And women kept saying, you know, we've been hired to this company to make a change, but we're not being included. So how do we go about elbowing our way into these rooms? And then once we're in the rooms, how are we making sure that people are even listening to us? So these women came up with a really cool idea of amplification. So when one of them had a key point or an idea that was going to be a great change for their team, the other woman would actually come up and repeat that idea and give credit back to the original author. This would help the audience and the room essentially notice that this woman came up with this idea and then allow them to discuss it and talk about the idea and if it would be something that would work for them. So this was a really interesting story of how we can amplify underrepresented voices. And this is something, another thing that you can actually implement on your team. We created this flywheel to help teams understand why it's important. Something that we actually do on our security teams at AWS is we'll start off meetings with this flywheel and just remind people of how they can be better allies. So for example, if an underrepresented individual uh, voices an idea, then you as an ally could say, oh, Carl, that was really interesting that you mentioned that we should move this hard drive mm -hmm. over to another data center. Mm -hmm. And essentially that would allow everyone else to see that Carl came up with this idea, I credit it back to him, and we can now discuss if it will work. And what's so important about this and the key why is it's going to create a more equitable workplace so that people feel more included and will escalate and bring up more uh, types of innovative creative solutions, which is the whole reason for having diverse and inclusive teams to begin with. So when we think about ID&E, it can sometimes be uncomfortable, but I actually think it's a really cool parallel to security conversations. Um, with us being security professionals here, I think we all know that security conversations can be hard and difficult at times, especially if there's an incident occurring and there's tensions. And so something that can be interesting is just like security conversations where they can be uncomfortable, so can ID&E topics, and that's okay. We can lean into it. So you can see with the radical candor graphic here, what you wanna do is you wanna challenge directly, but also while caring personally. 
So if you were to talk about some type of uh, lived experience that you've had, you want to make sure that you're talking to the person directly and also being constructive in your feedback. Something that I like to think about instead of calling people out, you want to call them in. So I would say, hey, um, I heard that you said this comment, maybe a microaggression, um, and it might not have been a big deal to you, but to me it made me feel small. And I just wanted to let you know that maybe next time you could use this word instead. So a good example of that, um, I can see some people nodding. A good example of that is if you're talking about, oh, she was really aggressive in that meeting. Well, was she aggressive or was she assertive? And maybe thinking about shifting your perspective in that way. And so again, looping it back into security. So why is this important? It's going to help build your culture of escalation. So at AWS, we really pride ourselves on being an escalation friendly culture. If you escalate something in security and it turns out not to be an incident, that's okay. It's better that we make sure that we investigate and see if there's a potential um, event going on rather than not escalating at all. So if you're using the psychological safety of helping to amplify others' voices and creating a more equitable environment, it's going to lead to the likelihood that employees are going to be more engaged and they're going to be more open to sharing their opinions and their experiences, which there will make it more likely that they will escalate if they see a security issue. And again, this goes back to even top down, you'll wanna implement this even at the leadership level because if people are nervous to escalate to leaders, that means that there's a gap that your security team has and you need to remediate it. So something that's really interesting when it comes to uh, thinking about insider threat risk. So when it comes to inclusion and diversity, uh, when there's higher employee engagement, it's going to lead to reduce uh, risk of insider threats. And so this is going to be really interesting when it comes to looking at how are you engaging your employees, especially on your security team, and how are you thinking about the organization as a whole? If you're building different security awareness and promoting different types of initiatives, the more likely they are to be engaged in the organization, the more likely they will be to be loyal to protecting the data and assets of your company. So when we think about what are some different programs that we can implement within our security team to help with inclusion, one of my favorite ones is developing technical affinity groups. So you all might be uh, familiar with the employee resource groups. Uh, we call them affinity groups at Amazon, so I'll use that term interchangeably. But one of my favorite groups that we have here is actually the security TFC or technical field community. And it's essentially a group that people can come together that have a shared interest in security. So many people have security roles, uh, you, but you don't have to necessarily, you just have to have an interest. And so this is a really great way to build a supportive collaborative community. And what's really great too is that for your underrepresented folks in security, it helps create an environment too where they can have mentorship and collaborate. And what this is going to lead to is more security awareness for your organization. Um, one of my favorite parts is we get new launch releases early, so it really gets buy-in for people. And we've built this team, essentially, that is a community of security professionals. And it's great because we're always super excited when we get to see each other. I see some people in the audience here today. And it's always nice because you build that camaraderie and you're more likely to, again, escalate and bring up more creative and innovative solutions for your security team. Another really interesting aspect as well, so we've talked about mentoring. Um, I actually got to participate in a pilot for reverse mentoring at AWS, and this is where you flip the traditional model on its head, and instead of a senior professional mentoring someone that's early in career, someone who's early in career gets to mentor that executive. And it's really interesting because I will say it can be a little awkward at first because you're like, well, what do I know? Um, I've been working for 10 years in my profession and this person um, you know, is at the top tier of their career as an executive. But I found it actually to be a really interesting experience because there's a lot of different generational things that come up within security, like Carl mentioned with different social media platforms, different ways that Gen Zs and millennials use and share their data that executives might, from a different generation might not be thinking about. And so um, what's very key for this is to build a cone of trust and silence with your mentor-mentee relationship. And you can talk about different aspects and challenges that you're coming up with. So 
with the executive that I was paired up with, um, we built a really great, strong relationship, and we had a lot of really interesting talks on how can he be more supportive to black people in his organization, and women, and younger people, and how can he show up for them and make sure that not only is he you know, making sure that we have these events, but really having an impact, and it's not performative. And so that was a really interesting experience for me because not only are we able to drive different change, but it was also a way that I could mentor him on security as well because that wasn't his actual day-to-day um, -day job. But as we know, it's very important. So it was a really great way to kind of build, again, that security awareness within your organization. So calling back to the Garner report from 2023 of the human element, um, that predicted that in 2025, 50% of cybersecurity leaders will leave their role due to work-related stressors. And when we think about these stressors, it's going to be things such as non-equitable uh, on-call schedules. So if you're familiar with McKenzie, they came out with a Women in the Workplace report that reported that women were feeling even more burnout after COVID because not only were they taking care of their day-to-day -day job responsibilities, they also had kids at home and were taking on most of the housework as well. And then for black women, this was an even higher percentage of burnout um, because of COVID and also all of the racial tensions going on. And so something to think about with your security teams is obviously we're security professionals, but we're people outside of our jobs. We have different things going on, different life events, different world events that are happening around us that affect us. And so how can we have those conversations and check in with people? Because ultimately, the more stressed out you are, the more it will affect your decision making and thus your risk management of your security programs. So something that we like to talk about, um, especially as hiring managers and people that um, have security teams, is making sure that we have equitable on-call schedules. So looking at different holidays. As we know, adversaries are more likely to target holidays now, and how can we make sure that it's equitable to all people on our team? Also looking at time zone friendly calendar invites. It seems very simple. However, um, at Amazon, we have a lot of people in Seattle, so a lot of our time zones might be centered around uh, Pacific Coast, but how can we make sure that people in EMEA are also able to attend important uh, meetings and APJ? So something that we do is we'll have different times of calendar invites that repeat the meeting to make sure that we can include everyone on the team. And this helps a lot for increased knowledge sharing of our security and different security initiatives. And then again, like I talked about, we're all people outside of work. I always spend at least the first five minutes checking in with people when I get on a call, asking how their spouse is, their pets, what they're up to, any vacation plans, um, how they're feeling. And it really helps to create a more collaborative, supportive environment where you can truly know what's going on with someone. And if you're going through an incident, it's going to help keep tensions more calm because you know maybe something's affecting them outside of the workplace. And what's really great about this is it helps your adaptability on your team and also retaining top talent because they know that they're cared about and there's that support there. And when it comes to these programs, I get asked a lot by different types of teams, well, how do we know that we're doing well? You know, do we just see that we have underrepresented folks on our team? How are we knowing that we're actually being successful? I actually went to RSA back in April and went to an ID&E birds of a feather discussion and one COE said, uh, or sorry, CEO, getting him confused, um, said that he was like, you know, I have to admit our diversity is so bad that we don't even want to run a survey. And I will say that is not the right way to go about it. I always like to say making sure that perfect is not the enemy of good. You want to start somewhere. You want to have a baseline. And so we have these metrics for you that can help you essentially know where to start, create that baseline so that you can see how you're improving and iterate over time. So some basic input metrics that you can look at are, what are the number of underrepresented teammates that you have, but also who identifies as allies, who's really bought into the idea of inclusion and diversity and making sure that your security teams are looking at all different types of angles, global markets, and users. Also looking at how many types of events are you having and who's actively participating in them. If you're hosting ID&E events once a month, but only two people are showing up, there's probably some type of gap there that you need to look at. And something that's going to be key, so back on one of um, Carl's aspects of the hiring and development, 
there was a statistic that 70% of, um, or its managers affect 70% of your mental health more than doctors and therapists. And I think we can all think maybe back to when we've had a bad boss before and how that's not fun. I see some heads nodding over there, yeah. Um, and how it can really ruin your day. Um, so when it comes to training your managers, that's gonna be key. And going back to the unconscious bias training that Carl talked about and how important that is. Because if your managers have unconscious bias towards promoting people or getting them involved with new security opportunities, you're going to lose talent because they're going to recognize that they're not supported. So you really want to make sure that you're making uh, that your managers are getting those development um, sessions in. And then lastly, but probably most important, do you have executives that are bought into this? If your leadership's not bought in, it's going to be a uphill battle trying to implement these things. Um, with the executive sponsorship, you also get budget that's allocated. And that's going to be great for making sure that you have that executive support that can help push things forward when you have a challenge of implementing your new programs. And from here, you'll have your output metrics. So based on the input metrics that you put in, you'll be able to see the um, results of your success, that you have more diverse hires within your security roles, how many people are getting promoted within those security roles, and how long are they actually staying within those roles on your team. It's something to uh, keep an eye on as you're building out these different programs. Also going back to employee engagement, so something that we do is we send out what's called connection scores. So think of it, um, some companies I know use Pulse to get a pulse on how people are feeling. So that's a really great way to ask people, are you feeling included on your team? Is your manager calling on you and asking you to speak up and share ideas? And that will really give some key indicators on how you're performing when it comes to inclusion on your security team. And lastly, something that I think is really interesting, at AWS we actually do look at um, when we're escalating, so our different set twos, we have something called an and on cord where you pull the cord and it stops everything because there's an issue on it. We actually look at when those are decreasing and people pulling those cords and escalating, we actually see that as an indicator that there's some type of issue in terms of hesitancy to escalate. So are people nervous to tell leadership that there's a problem? Are people not feeling included? Are they disgruntled? So they're not going to bring up a big security issue. So I think that's something really important that you can also track um, with your leadership and team. And so when it comes to retaining your diverse security teams, we put together this roadmap that once you've hired people, you have your pipeline set up, how are you actually gonna keep them on your team and continue to build and promote that talent? So similar to the first roadmap, the first one to three months are really gonna be around discovery. So what is your current state of inclusion? Are you doing a great job? Maybe you could do better. I think everyone personally can do better. Um, and then how are we looking at retention metrics? So even breaking it down to underrepresented numbers. Are you retaining people, but are you retaining all the people on your team or is it just a certain subject of intersectionality? And then also something that I find really helpful is having workshops on inclusion and different microaggressions. There can be microaggressions of all different types, uh, so not just you know what you might think about with racial and gender diversity, but age discrimination, um, neurodiversity discrimination, and how can you be more inclusive in the language that you're using, similar to what Carl said with some of the different security terminology. And then moving into the month three and six, so how are you establishing a clear progression for these employees on your security team. Are you reaching out and giving them new initiatives? So let's say you have someone on your team that's underrepresented and they might have come from a non-traditional background. Are you pairing them up for paired programming with a more senior developer on your team? Are you looking at ways that they could maybe get into incident response and feel that acceleration that Carl felt mm -hmm. that really made him want to stay mm -hmm. in this industry? Um, and again, moving into that technical affinity programs, how are you building a supportive community of people that are coming together and talking about different security solutions and how they can be more innovative? And establishing those metrics and KPIs to make sure that your team is actually following through on the different mission that you've set. And then lastly, but very importantly, you might see that I've kind of set this up from a NIST framework, so we're gonna want to uh, iterate. <laughs> so how are we validating and iterating what we're already doing? You're gonna wanna make sure you're regularly collecting feedback. 
I know that that can be scary sometimes and leaders are, say, you know, I don't know if I even want to know. You do want to know um, because you want to make sure that you catch it early, you identify gaps and making sure that you're constantly improving and having those regular uh, trainings on how you can be more inclusive. And then lastly, but also very importantly, making sure that you're actually celebrating the achievements of inclusion and diversity. Uh, part of the Women in the Workplace report uh, was that women reported that they did a lot of id &E work but weren't actually credited for that in their promo. So it would say, well, maybe you did build this technical affinity group, but how many um, JIRA tickets did you actually close this year, Sarah? And so thinking about how are people not only helping build your security solutions, but building a more empathetic, inclusive culture to, again, raise your security awareness. <clears throat> And one interesting case study, so I actually wanted to give a shout out to the Amazon Security Lake team. Um, one of the people on the team, Ross Warren, who was responsible for gathering a bunch of different data and perspectives. So essentially, Amazon Security Lake um, was announced back at reInvent, and it had the goal of becoming generally available by May 2020, or 2023, and they needed to gather as much input as they could so that they could have the best solution for our customers. And you might be familiar with different engineering teams where sometimes they're like, oh yeah, we're definitely the smartest guys in the room. We know what we're doing. We don't need to talk to anyone else. Uh, the Amazon Security Lake team did not follow that. They did an amazing job of reaching out to so many different customers and internal teams and partners. So they actually ended up working with 23 internal teams in AWS and 70 different partners. And through that, they were able to include different types of teams that are working on different aspects of Amazon Security Lake that brings together different logging and features. And then thinking from a customer perspective, what are the different types of customers and what are they looking for in a security lake? Um, and by being inclusive and having this diversity of perspective, they were able to strengthen the different features and think about different defenses that they hadn't thought about before, um, and thus leading to a successful launch at um, the end of May, so May 30th. So shout out to Ross Warren and the Amazon Security Lake team uh, for their awesome inclusion. So how does this all come together? So when we think about inclusion and diversity and strengthening your defenses, it's going to enhance perspective and innovation on your team. So when we look about security challenges from multiple angles and thinking about how we identify blind spots and developing different innovative solutions, it's also going to allow your team to have increased cultural competency and adaptability. So if you have people from all different types and walks of life, they're going to be thinking about the global market and different users and user design and how accessibility might be something that you need to definitely prioritize in your security solutions. So therefore, it's going to make for being more innovative and bringing better solutions for your customers. Also, when we go back to thinking about reducing burnout and having more equitable schedules, more time zone friendly calendar invites and checking in on your peers, it's going to help to reduce that burnout, which will then have more robust decision making so that when you think about your risk management and mitigation strategies, you're able to fully think through that and um, making sure that people are their best selves at work and can have those vulnerable conversations if they are having a difficult time. And lastly, by making sure that you're including people, you're going to improve your employee engagement, which will then reduce your insider threats. And that's going to be something that, as um, more CISOs look to the human-centric security design, making sure that we do have types of mechanisms to decrease that insider threat risk. So we do have some homework for you. Um, and I do want to applaud you all for coming today. It's always the first yes. step to learning about how can you be more inclusive um, for your security teams. So call to action. These slides will be available and we'll have different resources for you that you can actually implement these roadmaps. So the roadmap that Carl went over about how to build and hire diverse team members um, and really looking for that diversity of perspective. And then also how can you retain them once you have them on your team and building that collaborative supportive environment. Another thing that I wanted to point out, when you're building out these programs, again, making sure that it's not performative. You want to think about how you can have long-term value impact in these programs. So even if it takes more time to implement them, that's okay, um, because you can think about how life-changing it can be for some of the underrepresented people on your team. And then lastly, when we think about different KPIs, you're going to want to make sure that inclusion and diversity is a core value and KPI for your team, like security attach and different metrics would be for your security. 
Um, and this is going to be something that will help drive that executive sponsorship so that you can see how you're succeeding with those input and output metrics. Um, and then lastly, with the wrapping it up of, you know, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. We all have to start somewhere. Inclusion and diversity can be a very tough topic to talk about, and that's okay. We want to embrace the discomfort the same way that you would with a tough security conversation, because ultimately we all want to come out on the better end of things together. And with inclusion and diversity, it's not only a social responsibility that you want to take up, but it's also imperative to, again, making your strength, strengthening your defenses for your security team. So we do have some additional resources, and in the slides there's also links to all the different reports as well. Um, and these are some of our AWS partners that you can look into. So Cyversity, AWS Women's Security, Black Girls Hack, um, Executive Women's Forum, and we have lots of others on our webpage that you can essentially use their resources that you can implement these programs to um, include and make your security team more diverse. So in conclusion, this quote is actually about security awareness training, but I thought it was perfect for inclusion and diversity as well. So lasting change requires commitment. If you stop, you don't stand still, you lose ground. So thank you again for attending. We really appreciate it. And hopefully you now have a pathway to have more diverse and inclusive security teams. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn and we would love to hear your feedback in the